This episode of The History Guy is brought to you by My Heritage. There are many reasons to study your own family history, but perhaps none is better than simply that history deserves to be remembered. When the first English settlers arrived on a peninsula in the James River some 416 years ago, there were an estimated 15,000 Native Americans living in the region, and the relationship between the English settlers and those Native Americans would define much of subsequent history. Perhaps the most famous of those was Pocahontas and the chief that the English called Powhatan, but there were many tribes living in the Tidewater area, and the fates of each of those tribes were an integral part of American history, albeit long before we called it the United States. The fate of one particular tribe, the Wicocomico, deserves to be remembered. I'm really excited that today's episode is sponsored by MyHeritage, which is a leading global family research and DNA service. Thank you to the good folks at MyHeritage for supporting the History Guy. It's really a perfect fit. You know how much I love history, and what is more fun and interesting than finding out about your own family history that deserves to be remembered? Really, it couldn't be easier. The pack comes in the mail, only four pieces plus instructions, and that's lucky she doesn't well, seem all that interested. But Pocky wants to take the test. Sorry, not for cats. Not for cats! Anyway, you just swab your cheeks. It only takes a few seconds. Break off the ends in these little vials, pack it all up, and send it off. Pocky's real interested in the results. While you wait, you don't have to twiddle your thumbs. You have great tools where you can research your family history, or you can upload family photos, and then you can use this fun tool called Deep Nostalgia to animate or colorize them. That's my great-great-uncle Euphrates. He was a haberdasher in Schenectady. Then come your results. You get a DNA profile and an ethnicity estimate. It's a fun and easy way to discover your origins. You might even find new relatives. Okay, so here are my results. I'm really excited about this. I have no idea. I am 4% North African. I thought I knew a lot about my family, but there were a couple of real surprises here. Pocky was surprised too. It gave me some more things to research about the history of the history guy. And one of the best things about my heritage is that you are the sole owner of your DNA data. They will never sell or license your DNA data. My Heritage has a lot of really great tools for researching your family tree or better understanding your DNA results or maybe even finding extended family. Sign up using the link in the description and use the coupon code and you'll get free shipping. And you also get a 30-day free trial of My Heritage's best subscription for family history research. And if you decide to continue that service, which is really amazing, you get a 50% discount. Order your kit today and begin that first process of learning about your own history that deserves to be remembered. First, a note on pronunciation. The Algonquian languages, from which many of these names are derived, are largely extinct today, and the English sources spell the names in many ways. I've done my best to adhere to modern pronunciation guides. Before the English arrived in Virginia, a confederacy of Native American tribes had begun to form in the region. Details about the region prior to European colonization are scant, but by the late 1500s, the confederacy was made up of four to six tribes organized under a paramount chief. Each tribe had its own leadership, and while the paramount chief had some wider powers, he generally did not control the day-to-day -day life and decisions of the tribes within the Confederacy. Sometime in the late 1500s, the man the colonists call Powhatan became the leader of the Confederacy. The Powhatan chiefs were hereditary, but their chiefly lines were matrilineal. While it was the men who ruled, they derived their right to rule through their mother, who would have been a daughter of a previous chief. While the colonists referred to the paramount chief as Powhatan, that was not his name. The tribe he led was known as the Powhatan, and the colonists also understood it as the name of the settlement where he lived, which sat at the falls of the James River. His personal name was Wahan Seneca, according to English accounts. Wahan Seneca was a powerful figure in the Virginia Tidewater region. He had a large house, an enormous family, including numerous wives, and would eventually hold sway over nearly the entire region. His parents' names and histories were never recorded by English sources. Wahan Seneca seems to have been the eldest of six children. He had three brothers and two sisters. His age isn't known for certain, but he was likely born sometime between 1540 and 1560. And likewise, it isn't certain when he became paramount chief, possibly as early as the 1560s. The Powhatan people called the Tidewater Senecamaca, meaning densely populated land. The Powhatan Confederation was built by Wahan Seneca in the late 1500s among tribes that spoke mutually intelligible Algonquian languages. The Chesapeake natives had defensive concerns. Other tribes which spoke other languages constantly threatened from the west and northwest in this period. 
Tribes from the Northwest benefited from faster canoes and metal axes that they'd acquired from the French. Indeed, the violence could be terrible. John Smith records Powhatan saying that he had seen the death of all my people thrice, and not one living of those three generations but myself. Helen Roundtree, a leading researcher on Virginia Native Americans, interprets that passage to refer to at least three devastating raids on Powhatan Town. The Confederacy probably formed in part due to these defensive concerns. A particularly rough period of droughts between 1564 and 1569 may also have encouraged tribes to band together. Wahan Seneca brought towns and tribes into the fold by violence and diplomacy, beginning along the James River. He also added chieftains across the bay on the eastern shore, who had access to clamshells used in valuable jewelry. All of these various tribes paid the Powhatan an annual tribute. Eventually, Wahan Seneca moved his capital from Powhatan Town to Wero Wokokomoko, which roughly means chief's place. The growing confederacy allowed Wahan Seneca to use the threat of force to bring in more tribes, turning to chieftains along the Rappahannock River to the north. Much of the actual process of the Confederacy's growth has been lost to history, but at least one event was passed on to a European writer later that demonstrates the violence involved. Between 1594 and 1596, the Confederation assaulted a town, killing the chief and most of them. He brought the survivors to work at his capital and sent one of his sons and a number of loyalists to live in the captured town. By the time Jamestown was founded, the Powhatan Confederacy had grown to include 30 tribes, including the Wicko Comico, who lived on the south side of the mouth of the Potomac River. The Jamestown colonists arrived in 1607 to find the Powhatan Confederacy at its greatest territorial extent, encompassing the entire Virginia coastal plain east of the fall line, with a few exceptions, and from the south side of the James River north to above the Rappahannock. In 1606, the Virginia Company of London dispatched three ships to begin a colony in Virginia. Among the 104 boys and men who would land in Virginia the following year was the famous John Smith. The colony struggled in its initial months, and within five months, around 60 of the original 104 settlers had died. In the summer of 1608, Smith began exploring the Chesapeake Bay. It was on this voyage that Smith first met the Wicko Comicos. He described them as smaller than other tribes, or very little. In a 1612 publication, Smith said that the Wicko Comico town sat near the entrance to the Potomac River, and that the tribe had around 130 fighting men. Later scholars estimated between 430 and 550 total tribe members. During the voyage, Smith met a Mosco, who was a Wicocomico Indian and who served as a guide and interpreter for the Englishmen on several explorations. Mosco was said to have an unusually heavy beard. For the most part, the local tribes had little or no facial hair. Mosco accompanied the party up the Potomac River. Mosco even convinced a chief to show Smith a valuable mine, which had silvery glitter of value to the locals. Smith collected some, but the English later found it contained no actual silver, so they were not interested. Smith had multiple other contacts with the Wicocomico as well in this period. The years that followed Jamestown's founding were fraught with conflict between the Powhatan and the English. Eventually, contact with the English would lead to the disintegration of the Powhatan Confederacy, but in the initial years, Jamestown's existence was tenuous. Fighting between the Powhatans and English first broke out in 1609. The war ended five years later with Pocahontas' marriage to John Rolfe. Wahan Seneca's later years of rule were less effective, and when he died in 1618, his younger brother, Optip Chapin, became paramount chief. However, Opti Chapin's power was weak, and another younger brother, Openchenkano, had become the true power in the Confederacy. Openchenkano had decided that the English needed to be pushed out and began planning an attack meant to wipe out the colonists. The Wicco Comico were a approached as part of this plan and at least initially agreed to be part of the attack, which became the Indian Massacre of 1622, where 400 English were killed, nearly a third of the white population. Open Chenico seems to have believed that this would be enough to convince the Europeans to leave and declared that before the end of two moons, there should not be an Englishman in all their countries. Of course, instead, the Englishman doubled down, exacted revenge for the massacre. Openchenikau was still the paramount chief when the Powhatan attacked again in 1644, but by then the Virginia colony was firmly entrenched, and he was captured and killed. The 1644 war ended with a peace treaty signed between the General Assembly of Virginia and the new Powhatan paramount chief. The 1646 treaty stipulated that the Confederacy's leaders would be appointed or confirmed by the king's governors, and that the Powhatan leave free of the tract of land between York River and James River. 
This effectively ended the Confederacy as it split the various tribes in two. While the English respected the southern boundary, the boundary north of the York River was lifted by the House of Burgesses in 1649. The Wicco-Comico remained in their ancestral lands near the Wicco-Comico River between the Rappahannock and Potomac Rivers for several more years, but as the colony continued to grow, so too did its desire to control and corral the remaining tribes. By the 1650s, colonists were beginning to move in the area, and the English pressured the Chickacoan to merge with the Wicco-Comico. In 1655, the Virginia court ordered a tract of land to be surveyed for the two groups together. The tribes were moved to an early kind of reservation, which gave them 50 acres per bowman, for which they received a total of 4,400 acres. Their original land was ceded to Virginia Governor Samuel Matthews. The Wicco Comico, the larger of the several tribes that were eventually merged, wanted their own leader, Pequim, to lead the combined tribe. But instead, the Virginia government installed the Chickcoan leader, Machuap, to be the chief. The court referred to him as so ancient and known a friend to our English nation. This apparently caused significant friction, as in 1657, a governor's order provided six English bodyguards for his protection. By 1659, he had been deposed entirely. The Wicco Comico struggled to maintain clear ownership to the land supposedly given to them, and by 1660 they were in court complaining that several Englishmen were encroaching on their land. A Robert Jones seems to have occupied some land that was in dispute, and eventually the court ruled that Jones could remain. However, the Wicco Comico remained unhappy, and in 1669 Jones complained that several Wicco Comico had broken into his house. The Wicco Comico lodged a counter-complaint. The Wicco Comico felt that the original survey had been improperly done, and they paid for a new one. According to a census in 1669, the tribe had 70 bowmen. Thirty years later, they were again in court against Jones, who claimed that the tribe had deserted land that he laid claim to. The Wicco Comico won that round in court. Still more Englishmen pressed on the territory, slowly taking small chunks of it, despite repeated appeals to the court. No sales or land sessions were ever recorded, but by 1683, a John Smith claimed the land, as he had been paying the quit rents and beaver tribute that was owed to Virginia by the tribe. By 1693, the chief, then called the king of the tribe, was William Taptico. Taptico was possibly a title, or perhaps his native name, in addition to the English William. He may have been a son of Machuap, but by that time the tribe was in severe decline, and for a time Taptico seems to have lived in Maryland. According to Roundtree, by 1696 Taptico had sold what was left of his tribe's land in exchange for indefinite rights of use. In the late 1690s, Taptico's son, also William Taptico, became king, probably after his father sold the land. In 1705, they were recorded only as tenants to John Smith. Robert Beverly, a Virginia landowner who wrote extensively on the Native Americans of this time, reported that in 1705 the Wicco Comico had been reduced to only three men living, which yet keep up their kingdom and retain their fashion. Whatever the condition of the tribe, they had not entirely given up, and they paid their own tribute to the governor in 1710. But the tribe wasn't listed as a tributary in the governor's list of 1712, although it did defend the tribe in a court case in 1713. In 1716, a Wicco-Comico man was charged with burning several of the Jones family's houses. In 1718, William Taptico Jr. reaffirmed that the tribe's land had been sold to Smith and his heirs. Taptico Jr. died within the year, and his wife Elizabeth changed her name while executing his will from Taptico to the more English-sounding Tap. By 1622, she had moved to Spotsylvania County. In his will, Taptico was revealed to be a relatively wealthy man with varied livestock, boat rigging and oars, carpenter's tools, several changes of English clothing, a well-appointed house by English standards, and several books. He was even owed money by both fellow Native Americans and Englishmen. That seems a bit of a far cry from what Beverly called three men retaining their kingdom. William Taptico Jr. seems to have been the last man to have claimed kingship of the Wicco Comico, and after his death, the tribe seems to have dispersed. The Virginia Assembly didn't appoint another king, considered the Wicco Comico gone by 1719. The Wicco Comico seemed to have just disappeared, nearly forgotten history. While they have no lands and have been considered defunct for some 300 years, there are now descendants of the Wicco Comico who are seeking recognition for the Wicco Comico Indian Nation from the American Bureau of Indian Affairs. William Taptico Jr.'s great-granddaughter, whose name was Elizabeth Tapp, married a man named Winstead in 1785. 
1869, their great-granddaughter, whose name was Mary Ellen Browder, married a man named Frederick Monroe Bradford. And Mary Ellen Browder and Frederick Monroe Bradford were my great-great-grandparents. I'm the history guy and the ninth great-grandson of the last king of the Wicco Comico, and that deserves to be remembered. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you have to do is subscribe.